Well, then, and on the theme, we have a crisis, now what? And this is actually the ending of that theme, the, the final message on it. And we've looked at all like the same type of words, right? Re refocus, respond, revitalize. This morning, it's going to be remain. And I think it's very fitting, actually, that, that this is when this message hits us because I'm hearing a lot of restlessness right now. I'm hearing a lot from people who are actually starting to get angry that this is still going on or starting to get depressed or they're starting to get just restless and they want this thing just to be over. And so it's easy at this point, even as Christians, to start um, being selfish and self-seeking, to start... Um, not honoring God with the way that we think, with the way that we speak, with the way that we act. And so I think uh, this idea of remaining, which has the idea of perseverance, um, endurance, uh, is very uh, fitting for where we're at in, in relation to this corona coronavirus and how long it's been going on. And I would imagine there's many here today who are like, I just would like this thing to be over. And... I'm surprised nobody honked their horn on that because I'm sure there's many here that would like it to be over. Winston Churchill said this. He was addressing a, a school, Harrow School, in 1941. He said this to him, and this is all he said. Then he sat down, kind of interesting. He was the main speaker, or he was uh, one of the key speakers. He said, never give in, never give in, never, never Never, never, and nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never give in. And then he sat down. <laughs> I thought that was very fitting for <laughs> our, title, our title this morning. Never give in. Persevere. Continue to battle on. Whatever that looks like, and even as it changes, and, and even as rules let, are loosened up, but now the rules are made, because uh, we've seen that this week, right? It says this is going to be loosened up, but then yet there's other rules to go along with those that, that are, um, are lenient. The, I looked at a definition of perseverance has the idea of an old slogan. When the going gets tough, the... Tough, get going. But you know what? <laughs> in, the, in our time period and in this uh, uh, experience that we're all living in, when the going gets tough, the tough sit still. <laughs> so it's totally against us in what we think of individualism and, and what we want to do as, as humans, most of us anyway. And so perseverance looks different in different circumstances, in different situations. Well, we're going to be looking at three different passages of Scripture this morning with this idea of, what am I to remain? I'm going to tell you what I need to remain in. I need to remain in hope. I need to remain in contentment. And I need to remain in confidence. And we're going to look at three different passages uh, where we kind of get this, uh, this thinking from. So let's pray and we'll get into God's Word. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's still relevant and true and active. And I thank you how even when you put something together, even like uh, this list of messages that you put on my heart like uh, two months ago, that the one that's for today just seems so fitting for what I've been hearing from people um, this week, this idea of persevering, this idea of remaining true to you and uh, leaving the results with you, Lord. I just pray you'll use your word this morning in our lives to challenge us, to encourage us, and to even give us an idea of wisdom for what we should do in the days and weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. The first passage is Romans chapter 5. If you want to look there, you can. Romans 5, 1 through 5 is what we're going to be looking at first. Romans chapter 5, 1 through 5. It seems like every Sunday we have some wind. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace 
with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces, brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. This is talking about, Romans is about salvation primarily. Um, if you look through uh, chapter 1 and 2, talk about, the 1 is about the sinner who knows he's a sinner. Chapter 2 is about the righteous man who thinks he's righteous in and of himself, but that's still sin, that's self-righteousness. And then it talks about in chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We get to Romans 4 and 5, it talks about justified, how I can be made right before God, and that's what this word peace is. In fact, the definition of the word peace is a sense of well-being regardless of life circumstances. That's very fitting, isn't it? Peace is a sense of well-being in spite of life circumstances. So it's the idea that no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what crisis, problem, whatever, and even in this crisis... You can have peace through God in the midst of the crisis and peace of God that th for, between you and him, everything's right once you accept him as your savior. Once you say, yes, Christ is the one who can justify me of my sin, who took the place of my sin. But he says, therefore, having been justified. In other words, he's talking to believers here. Therefore, since you've been saved, you've been justified, you've been made right before God, we can have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 3. And well, starting with the end of verse 2, he says, And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only in this, not only in our salvation, not only in the hope of the glory of how great God is, but also we exult in our tribulations. Well, that word exult, it can be defined. You could use the word boast. You can use the word jo um, uh, rejoicing. So he could say this. And not only this, but we also boast in our tribulations. But we also um, rejoice in our tribulations. Is, that's a difficult um, task, isn't it? To rejoice in the midst of your tribulations. But he's saying here, because of the relationship that you and I can have with Christ, and if you're saved, you do have in Christ, then... You can exalt, you can boast about your tribulations, you can, you can actually be thankful for them. Why? And he goes on to say, knowing that the tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance. <laughs> some, days, some day, people don't pray for perseverance, you know, right? Because you know that if you pray for it, he's going to give you opportunities to um, build it. Because look at the next thing. And perseverance, proven character. Perseverance can prove your character. Now, God's desire is that the trial tries you in such a way that it brings about perseverance, and that perseverance develops your character. A, a way that I think of this when I read this text is, is um, anybody who's ever lifted weights or gone running or you've tried to build muscles in your body, and when you're building the muscle, when you start, especially the first three weeks, there's a lot of pain, and it's not much fun in and of itself. But after a few weeks, the pain starts subsiding, and you start seeing the benefits of the lifting. You get maybe more um, energy. You get maybe a little stronger. You, you maybe think you look a little better. You know, whatever. But, but, you, but you, get, you gain that's the same thing with trials in our life. God is desiring that that perseverance um, ends up proving our character. So the more our character gets tried, which it does in, um, in trials, and probably yours is getting tried in many different ways, even right now in the crisis we're in, and the more it gets tried and you come through it, the more it's building that character quality in your life. Which... <laughs> cheer up, it helps you face the next one to come. And cheer up, it helps you to face one that's bigger. 
But really, that's what it's supposed to do. That's what God's desire is. He said, because we have Christ in our lives, because we're saved, now this perseverance, this, this trial that leads to perseverance can lose, lead to per- proven character. And it doesn't stop there. And proven character leads to hope. When we do it God's way and we grow in, in this characteristic of even perseverance, then we get more and more hope for the future. More and more hope even in the midst of the situation. More and more hope even in spite of the situation, I guess I would say. So, um, and how do we do that? It kind of tells us very specifically because, and hope does not disappoint. Why not? Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. How do we realize that hope in our life? Because of the Holy Spirit that's in us. He is the one who helps to build that hope in our lives. He is the one who helps us to persevere through the trial. He is the one who develops that proven character in our life. It reminds me of a story, and I've probably said it before, but when I was thinking of this, I was thinking of this, um, this example. And uh, many years ago, oh, I don't know, 15, 17 years ago, we took a bunch of youth up to up Jay Peak. And I know I've said it before, but it fits here. And this young girl hated walking up. I mean, we weren't even 20% of the way up the hill, and she was already whining and complaining. So bad. And I stayed with her, being the most patient person of the bunch. Do you believe that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I did. God gave me that. And I tried to encourage her in a loving way. And we, we made it to the top of that mountain. But she hated every step of it. Every step. It was a trial for her. She maybe wasn't necessarily physically fit, but still, she didn't even like the idea of it. She hated it. But when she got to the top, there was a glow to her. There was a joy. And I thought of this word, there was this idea of hope even, that she had accomplished something. She would made it through. And there was like a glow to her that wasn't on the way up through, I can tell you. It was miserable on the way up through. But when she got there, and you know what, that same thing can, God wants to accomplish in our lives, that even though the, the, the tr- crisis is hard, the trial is hard, and, it, and sometimes it's just so hard to persevere. It's so hard to keep walking forward, to keep going in the direction that God wants us to go, to keep acting in a way that God wants to, to keep responding in a way that honors the Lord. It's so hard. But yet, when we get through it and we get to the other side, we can have that glow, that hope that comes from persevering, being proven in our character. And you know what? And it helps us to face the next trial without as much um, without as much pain, I could say, maybe. Is that the right word? But with more um, hope. It reminds me of our church verse, Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the only way that we can truly have hope in the midst of our trial and in the midst of our and be able to persevere and to be able to actually be, have proven character from it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, we're helpless. We're hopeless, I meant to say. We're hopeless. It's no wonder there's so many people down and discouraged and in the dumps because of the crisis they're facing. Because without the Holy Spirit, they are hopeless. So if you're not saved, it's no wonder. Because without him, you're hopeless. But if you are saved and you're not being led by the Spirit, and we talked earlier and a few weeks ago, not being yielded to the Spirit and not allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life, then even as a believer, you can have a sense of hopelessness because you're trying to do it in your own strength and without the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in your life in the midst of your situation. So what is one of the things that, We should remain, remain in hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who can help you to persevere. He's the one who can prove your character. He's the one who can give you hope. And he wants to, by the way. 
God does not want, don't let God waste this crisis on you. God wants to use it in your life to give you a hope that you didn't have before. All right, next passage. Spilled a little water on me. Next passage is uh, Philippians 4. Well-known passage to many of us. We usually read the verses before it. Philippians 4. I don't have trouble turning pages. I just have trouble stopping them from turning. All right. Philippians 4. I just want to start with verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in, every, in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can endure all things, or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, you may say, well, that's easy for Paul to say. He wrote half the New Testament, and God was with him wherever he went. But I just want you to know, he, he said, I have learned to be content. Well, learn. Learning is a process, right? He said, I didn't get zapped with contentment. <laughs> I learned it. Well, how did he learn it? He said, I learned it by suffering need. I learned it by having excess. I learned it in all the trials and troubles of life. If you look at Paul, he talks, there's a laundry list of things that he went through. He was beaten many times. He was shipwrecked. He was um, left for dead. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. And he did it all for Christ. And it said that in the midst of all my trials, he said, I have learned to be content. Contentment is something we learn. It's not just something that happens to us. Because you and I both know that things can be going good in life with no trials, and we still won't be content. So contentment is not a natural phenomenon that happens just because of my circumstances, good or bad. Contentment is learned. And what does Paul say? It is learned. I said this. It is realized by relying on Christ's strength and not his own. How did he learn contentment? Because he learned by leaning on Christ for his strength. I can endure all things through Christ who gives me strength. He didn't say, I can do all things because I've gotten so strong. I, he didn't say, I can do all things because uh, I figured it out on my own. No, he said, I can endure only because of Christ who gives me the strength that I need. On my own, I can't do it. And that's how he learned contentment. Because he learned to rely on Christ's strength. And that's why he could say, and I just want to read a few verses that go along with it of where he said in 2 Corinthians, a passage probably many of you know, if I can get there. This is, it's the same Paul writing this. And he says this, because of a surpassing greatness of um, revelations, he said, God gave me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. In other words, to keep me from being prideful. To keep me from thinking it was all about me. And he said, God, in other words, Jesus, said, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul speaking now, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well, and here we go, content with weaknesses with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. How did he learn it? He learned through even this thorn in the flesh that Christ gave him, which we don't even know what it is. His ideas, but we nobody knows. But he prayed and God wouldn't take it away and said, no, I'm going to keep it with you. God gave us this crisis on purpose. Why? To make us miserable? No. To make us realize our need for him, yes. And to realize that we're not strong enough to face it. We're not strong enough to persevere on our own. We're not strong enough to remain content. 
We need His strength. But when we realize that, when He says, in my weakness, He is made strong. In my humility, Christ can shine forth. But when I think it's all about me, I kind of, I push Christ aside. I push God aside. And I elevate my own self instead of elevating the God who, who is the only one who can help me persevere. The only one who can help me get through it. Only one who can help me be content. So, he was, Paul, when he wrote this, was in jail. In Philip, He was in jail. And yet, he was telling them he could be content even in jail. Even in the midst of being wrongly accused. Or rightly accused, but for doing something right. Uh, rightly accused, but for doing something right, he was put in jail. Talking about Jesus. So, with Christ and his strength, you can have contentment even in the midst of this crisis. But without Christ, all you have to look forward to is anxiety, worry, distress, which, will, which many, I'm sure, are feeling. But I think this passage says, okay, but remain. You can remain content through Christ. You can remain hopeful through the power of the Holy Spirit. Stop looking to yourself for your source of strength and wisdom. Stop looking to your job for your source of strength and wisdom. Stop looking to other people for your source of strength and wisdom. Stop looking for your, at your freedom <laughs> to be able to congregate as your source of strength and wisdom. Look to Christ alone. And then thirdly, I want to go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. I didn't say what chapter, did I? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to talk about confidence here. I'm going to read, uh, skip around a little bit, but I'm going to read a bunch of verses. We'll start with verse 7 and 8. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing, surpassing greatness of the power <laughs> will be of God and not from ourselves. Ever hear that? See that again, right? Not of ourselves, from God. Where do we need to get our strength? From God, not ourselves. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> we are <coughs> we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing. <coughs> Persecuted but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, <clears throat> so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Go down to verse 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Okay, why don't we lose heart? He talked about stress and affliction and and talked about being struck down but not destroyed. But then he talks about because of Jesus himself. Why do we not lose heart? But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if the, the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. And then down verse uh, 6, we'll pick up again. Therefore, being always of good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body, that would be in heaven, if you're saved, and to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we also make it our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. A lot in this passage, but a couple things I just wanted to focus on. 
he keeps saying that this is temporary. This momentary light affliction, it may seem like it's dragging on and on and on. It may seem like it's never going to be over. It may seem like it's taking forever. And that's the way many trials in life can seem, right? Like they have lot going on and on and they're never going to end. But Jesus says, the Word of God says, that it's a momentary light affliction and has nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. So it talks about something that's very light. That's the affliction. And something very heavy, and that's heaven. And it's not using heavy and light in a bad and good way. It's saying it's such a small thing what we're going through here on this earth compared to how great a thing it'll be when we're in heaven with God. So a couple of things he brings out here. This is temporary. This situation, even our time on earth, it's temporary. Right? Life is a vapor. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. But also, my body is temporary. This house, this tent, in fact, it calls it a tent because a tent is a temporary dwelling place. And so my body is called a tent. The, what you see here before you, this is a tent. It's decaying every day. It's not going to last forever. It's going to be gone. It is temporary, just like the, the affliction or the crisis that we're in right now. It's temporary, just like all crises put together in our lives. They're all temporary. But he goes on to say, you look back at that, these verses. God's got a permanent, eternal home for us in heaven. If you know Christ is your Savior this morning, there's a heaven, there's a place in heaven for you waiting for when you pass. Eternal. Never be destroyed. Also, he talks about this tent, and we will get a new house. We have an eternal body waiting for us, too. And for some of, some of us, that means more and more as years go by, right? <laughs> as we think of getting sick or, or our bodies start depleting, we think of, oh, I can't wait for that new body. But that's a reality. He's saying this is all temporary. This affliction's temporary. This life is temporary. This body is temporary. But don't lose heart. What verse was that? Verse uh, 16, therefore, do not lose heart. Do not get discouraged. Do not get downcast. Do not get destroyed. As he guess says we get struck down, but not destroyed. Instead, have confidence. Confidence, because this isn't all there is. Confidence, because this trial won't last forever. Confidence, because this body, <laughs> I'm going to get a new one. Confidence, because this life, I'm going to get even a better life in heaven. Confidence that we can have because we know Christ. But God has an eternal place for, us and for me in heaven, and he'll give me a new body. But without heaven, guess what? This is all there is. You might as well be discouraged and distraught because you have nothing else to look forward to. Without, without heaven, this is all there is. And the trials of life really mess that up because this is all you've got. Without heaven, you have nothing to look forward to. That's a pretty sad place to be. With Christ, we have confidence because this isn't all there is. There's something far better coming. We can make it through. We can persevere because this isn't all there is. But without Christ, there's reason. So if you're saved, remain faithful. Persevere. Remember, you, you can have hope with the power of the Holy Spirit. You can have contentment with the strength that Christ wants to give you. And you can have confidence because of what you know, and that is that this is temporary, and God has something eternal waiting for you. But if you're here this morning, whether in this parking lot or listening online, and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I challenge you right now, humble your heart. Humble yourself and say, yes, I need 
Romans 10 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Say a prayer, something like this, between you and God. Say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know my sep- sin separates me from a perfect, holy God, from you, O oh God. I believe that Jesus came to earth, died for my sin, was buried, in, and rose again and conquered death, and is preparing a place for those who choose him. Say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Save me. If you said that prayer today and you meant it, you are saved. You now can have confidence. You now can have hope. And you now can have contentment, even in the midst of this trial. For all of those who do know Christ as your Savior, I want to leave you with a quote by Wendell And some of you know this because you were in his class. But every year, he would open up the the school, the the first-year students at Word of Life, and and he'd make them memorize a statement. And this is a statement. I will not quit. By God's grace, I can do it. So I want you right now, if, if you're a believer in Christ, this idea of persevering, remaining, I want you to repeat after me in your, in your cars. I will not quit. By God's grace, I can do it. I didn't hear very many of you. Let's try it again. I will not quit. By God's grace, I can do it. May that be your motto. Remain, persevere. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your perfect timing when many of us, many are struggling with how this is dragging on and it's being harder and harder to be content, harder and harder to be hopeful, harder and harder to, um, yeah, to remain, to persevere. And so, Lord, I pray that the challenge from your word this morning will help each one of us in whatever areas that we are struggling with and persevering in a way that honors you. And Lord, may we, even this week, think of what your word said. And like the one verse said, therefore we do not lose heart. Because of you, we win it. In Jesus' name.